Farmers and ranchers work in the sun constantly. After all, it's part of the job. But what are the risks of too much sun? Tonight, we'll discuss the danger signs of skin cancer with helpful advice that could save your life. Good evening and welcome to Rural America Live. I'm Christina Loren. Experts from the University of Nebraska Medical Center are joining us tonight to talk about the long-term effects of sun exposure, what you can do to protect yourself and your family, the warning signs to look out for, and the latest treatment options. And we want to hear from you. Have you or somebody that you know had a negative experience with prolonged sun exposure? Share your story tonight. Or maybe you have a tip for protecting yourself when working outdoors. Our phone lines are open. The number to call is 877-731-6733. We will be taking your call shortly. But first, let's welcome in our panelists who are joining us live from the University of Nebraska, Omaha. Chancellor of UNMC, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and the founding chair of the Department of Dermatology, Dr. Ashley Wysong. Thank you both for joining us tonight. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us. Now, Dr. Gold, UNMC recently added the Department of Dermatology, which tells me that there is a need for dermatologists and for treatment for issues like skin cancer. What drove UNMC to add the department? Well, that's exactly right, Christina. So uh, there are several factors that are going on. One, of course, is that farmers and ranchers and even uh, people in urban communities have increasing exposure to the sun and to other risk factors for skin cancer. Secondly, as is true in our state, Nebraska, but is also true in many rural communities uh, and across our nation, there's a definite shortage of uh, board-certified dermatologists, physicians that are specifically knowledgeable and skillful in diagnosing and treating diseases of the skin. And then thirdly, as more and more patients are being successfully treated for cancer, are having transplants, or have other complex medical conditions, there are dermatologic, there are skin-related issues associated with those diagnoses and those treatments that need to be accurately diagnosed and that need to be treated. And so for all of those reasons, we wanted to build a successful department here at the university that would, of course, train the next generation, that would do cutting-edge research in the area of skin cancer, and that would also provide uh, services for complex skin diseases, including cancer, but many others. And that's how we got to recruit Dr. Wysong. Let's meet Dr. Wysong now. You are a dermatological expert. Tell us a little bit about your background and how it came about that you partnered up with UNMC. Yeah, absolutely, Christina. So I actually grew up in uh, rural America in Nevada, Missouri, a small town just south of Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, first in my family to go into medicine. And uh, Dr. Gold and Dean Brittigan recruited me here to the University of Nebraska, as, as Dr. Gold mentioned, uh, really because we have an urgent and uh, really important need for ongoing dermatologic care here in not only Nebraska, but many other rural parts of America. Uh, I was very fortunate to receive medical training at Duke University and then did my dermatology residency at Stanford University. I did advanced fellowship training in cutaneous oncology and skin cancer surgery at Scripps Clinic and then uh, now here at the University of Nebraska and excited about building our dermatology programs and really helping to uh, not only take care of patients but train the next generation in dermatology. Well, we are very excited to have you both on the show with us tonight. Let's jump right into tonight's content. Farmers and ranchers, it's impossible to do their jobs without getting outdoors. Let's start with the most common types of skin cancer. It's for you. Um, <laughs> all right. So absolutely. So we know that ultraviolet radiation plays a major role in the development of skin cancer. And so there are really three major types of skin cancer. Uh, all of them are really coming from that top layer of the skin, uh, which is where we find that the top layer of skin gets the most amount of sun exposure. The number one cause of skin cancer is actually basal cell carcinoma. It's the most common skin cancer. So really one in four Americans will develop a basal cell carcinoma over their lifetime. The great news is that basal cell carcinoma is very highly cured, uh, typically under local anesthesia in an outpatient setting uh, with very high cure rates. Typically uh, does not go outside of the skin to other parts of the body. The second most common skin cancer is called squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma is about 
one million Americans develop squamous cell carcinoma uh, every year. And again, very highly cured, typically under local anesthesia. But this, different than basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma does have the potential to go outside of the skin, uh, typically to the lymph nodes or other parts of the body, about 3 to 5% of the time. So it is important uh, that patients are getting good care and potentially may need multidisciplinary management. Now, melanoma is the third most common type of skin cancer and is typically thought to be the deadliest form of skin cancer. Uh, and melanoma can go outside of the skin to other parts of the body like the lymph nodes, the lungs, the liver. And, but the vast majority, about 90%, are cured with surgery alone. But it is the skin cancer that is the deadliest and that often does uh, require multidisciplinary management with surgical oncology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and when it does get outside of the skin, really does need that holistic and multidisciplinary approach at a large medical center. And coming up a little bit later on in the show, we're actually going to show you what to look for so that you can be a little bit more familiar with the warning signs if they are showing up on your body from sun exposure. But I understand that there is currently a skin cancer epidemic. Talk about that, Dr. Gold, the dangers that are associated with skin cancer as well. Well, what we've noticed here in Nebraska, which we believe is true widely across rural America, is that the number of skin cancers continues to go up. And part of that is due to continued ultraviolet exposure. Uh, some of it is probably due to better diagnosis, although we do see, particularly from the rural communities, a good deal of late-stage disease, which means that it's been diagnosed fairly late into the course of the disease. And of course, as is true with any type of cancer, the later the disease is diagnosed, the harder it is to treat, the longer the treatment's going to be, the lower the cure rates are. Now, the good news is that the overwhelming majority of skin cancers, particularly the basal cell cancers and almost all of the squamous cancers, are curable. Is that not right, uh, uh, Dr. Weissong? That is correct, Dr. Gold. And the vast majority of skin cancers are, as we mentioned, you know, really curable under a local anesthesia alone and surgery that can be done in the outpatient setting. You know, but as you might be able to see on your television here, we are really seeing an increase in the overall number of skin cancers that are being diagnosed. And as Dr. Gold mentioned, you know, one in four Americans will develop skin cancer, and we are now treating around five million skin cancers a year in the United States. Wow. And so what you really don't realize sometimes is if you take all of the cancers that we treat in the United States and combine them, you add them all up, uh, there are actually four times as many skin cancers as all other cancers combined in the United States today. Wow. So therefore, it's particularly important to try to get to early diagnosis, as is true with any type of cancer, Absolutely. Uh, and to try to get early treatment. Uh, to prevent it from becoming more advanced. Absolutely. And you know, melanoma, we mentioned, is the deadliest form of skin cancer. Uh, it is actually the number five skin cancer in the United States. But as you can see here, non-melanoma skin cancer, or the basal cell and squamous cell skin cancers, uh, actually, as you can see, make up many, many more cancers than all the other cancers combined. So three to four times more common than all cancers combined. And we see this number approaching upwards of four to even five million new diagnoses of non-melanoma skin cancer a year in the United States. Wow, those numbers are startling. Who is at highest risk for skin cancer? And what do I do if I am an individual who falls into that category? Absolutely. So that's a great question. Uh, we typically think that there are both genetic uh, as well as environmental exposures that can put you at higher risk for skin cancer. So genetically, uh, we typically say patients with light skin, light hair, light eyes are going to be at higher risk for skin cancer than those that have darker skin or darker hair or darker eyes. Uh, having a family history of skin cancer actually puts an individual at about a two-fold increased risk for the development of skin cancer. Having moles, particularly atypical moles on the skin, puts patients at higher risk for both melanoma as well as non-melanoma skin cancer. And then, of course, having a personal history of skin cancer puts you at a higher risk 
for developing a second or third skin cancer. So specifically, we know that if you've been developed with a skin cancer, your risk for being developed for being diagnosed with a second skin cancer in the next two years is about 50% chance. So before we get to the environmental causes, uh, does other types of cancer predispose people towards skin cancer? In other words, if you've been successfully treated for breast cancer or for prostate cancer, is that a risk factor? That is a fantastic question, Dr. Gold. So actually, we know that specifically leukemias and lymphomas uh, put patients at significantly higher risk for both melanoma as well as non-melanoma skin cancer. Even after treatment? Even after treatment. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly uh, CLL or the more, the more chronic lymphomas, uh, we think that there is an immunologic change within those patients that puts them at higher risk. So mm -hmm. when their immune system's not functioning right, uh, the body can't really survey and help clean up those cancers. Um, really, all of our patients who get uh, chemotherapy as well, they're going to be at higher risk for the development of, of skin cancer. Uh, and, and then the other big thing in terms of what other types of medical history can predispose patients to skin cancer uh, is going to be any type of immunosuppression, uh, like patients who undergo organ transplantation mm -hmm. sure. or lots of the different immune conditions like psoriasis, eczema, um, different types of arthritis. We put patients on life-saving medications, uh, but that can also put them at higher risk for the development of skin cancer. And there's a long list of environmental factors also that we probably should discuss. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, the number one preventable cause of skin cancer in the United States and really globally is ultraviolet radiation. Uh, and that's going to typically come in the form of, of radiation from the sun itself. Uh, we know that, page, that in general, people are getting more and more sun exposure. Mm -hmm. And that can be from outdoor workers, such as our agricultural workers and other uh, outdoor workers within our rural environments. Uh, that can be through increased recreational activity mm -hmm. outdoors. Uh, weekend warriors. The weekend warriors, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also are seeing an increase in skin cancer associated with ultraviolet radiation in an artificial form, like tanning beds and other types of ultraviolet rays. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's no doubt that the exposure to ultraviolet radiation uh, really puts patients at uh, the highest risk for skin cancer. Now, even one single sunburn in childhood, we know, can increase patients' risk of melanoma, the deadliest form, by up to twofold. Uh, the wow. other thing, yeah, the other thing we know Can is you think that about how many kids get at least one sunburn. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and so it really just uh, reminds us how important it is to really be protecting our the skin of our young ones and our little ones um, because of that high risk of melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer from even one blistering sunburn. Uh, the, the other type of environmental exposure that really is high risk is what we call that intermittent sun exposure. Mm -hmm. So the, the people or the patients who all winter long don't get a lot of sun exposure and then might go to a spring break and get quite a bit of sun exposure, they really can have a significantly higher risk for the development of skin cancer with that intermittent sun exposure. So again, more precautions, more early warning, uh, better care. Absolutely, and I think we see that theme throughout medicine. Medicine, uh, early diagnosis, access to excellent early treatment really can uh, be life-saving and life-changing. And we're going to talk about specific recommendations in a few minutes, Absolutely. Right? That's great. You know what's interesting to me is how powerful the sun is, how it can also weaken the elasticity of our skin, and prolonged sun exposure is actually the number one cause of premature aging. I believe you actually have some startling pictures for us to see that really drive this home. Absolutely, Christina, and you could not be more correct. Uh, exposure to ultraviolet radiation not only puts us at the highest risk for skin cancer, uh, but as you can see in this photograph here that has really been become famous, uh, is that this is the picture of a truck driver. And on the left side of the patient's face or on the right side of the screen, you can see the amount of sun damage to that to that pers individual person's face after driving a delivery truck for over 28 years in comparison to the right side of the face or on the left side of the screen that had a little bit more natural protection from the sun. And so there's no doubt that the ultraviolet radiation not only puts us at risk for skin cancer, uh, but also is really the biggest uh, predictor of advanced aging or early aging. So this is an important point because uh, many people may think that the glass that's in their car or in this case in their truck 
is protective, and that's mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. not the case, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that is absolutely correct. Increasingly, we think car manufacturers are working on trying to put in more ultraviolet protection, and we would strongly mm -hmm. encourage that. Uh, there are now multiple aftermarket companies that can actually go ahead and uh, apply an ultraviolet protective film. And you can put that in your car, in your tractor, in mm -hmm. any type of recreational vehicle, and it really can be done for just a few hundred dollars. So that might be really important to people that spend their entire day outside. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow, and look at this picture. What, what are we looking at here? That is a very powerful image that we use in our clinics all of the time. And this is what's called a UV reveal imager. And so on the left, you can see a, a typical young patient uh, with normal lighting. And on the right is actually the special UV camera filter that can show you the damage that's already been done to your skin through ultraviolet radiation that may not yet be visible to the naked eye. And so you can see there's quite a bit of damage here that's not naturally uh, obvious to the naked eye. You and say, so this can be very impactful in terms of showing people the amount of damage that's already been done. Absolutely. You say it may not yet be visible, but down the line, as she continues to age, those spots will eventually come to the surface? That is absolutely correct. Wow. And does this also uh, increase the risk for skin cancer when you see a picture like that? It does make me very concerned for skin cancer. And we've found, we've done some studies using the UV reveal imager uh, within our clinics, and we found that it can be very powerful to help really encourage, particularly mm -hmm. our adolescents and young adults, uh, to use normal ultraviolet protection. So I was going to ask you, does it in encourage behavior, uh, safer behavior, people using more sunscreening products or better clothing and that sort of thing that we'll talk about? Absolutely. I think we found, particularly in adolescents and young adults, that when we can focus on uh, not only the cancer risk, because sometimes young adults will say, well, well, I'm not going to get cancer for a few more years. What does that matter? But we found a that- A few years later, it might matter. A few years later, it might matter. But when we talk sometimes as well about the changes on uh, the overall appearance, uh, we find that it can have a help in terms of improving increasing uh, photoprotective behaviors. Okay, this is such a fascinating topic and it's all encompassing for rural Americans. But before we go to break, we wanna remind you, our phone lines are wide open. Join the conversation. The number to call is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions about sun exposure for our panel of experts. You can get your questions answered directly. Maybe you have an experience that you wanna share with us. We wanna hear from you tonight, 877-731-6733. We will be taking your phone calls when we come back and we'll talk about the warning signs Signs, what you should look out for when it comes to your skin. More Rural America Live with UNMC after this quick break. Welcome back to Rural America Live with UNMC. Tonight we are talking about the long-term risks of sun exposure for rural Americans and the warning signs that you should be looking out for. We want to welcome back our panelists joining us live from the University of Nebraska at Omaha, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, University Chancellor, and Dr. Ashley Wysong, founding chair of the Department of Dermatology. And remember, you are a big part of the show. Call in with your questions about sun exposure and share your experiences. Maybe you have a helpful tip for our audience about how you stay safe when working outdoors. We want to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. This is a life-saving show that we're all enjoying together, getting help from the experts. You know, let's talk about rural America. Is there evidence that Nebraskans and others who live in rural areas Areas are actually at higher risk for skin cancer? Well, absolutely is the case. And uh, we've seen the numbers just skyrocket in recent years. Mm -hmm. You know, some might say it's earlier diagnosis and better diagnosis, but unfortunately, that's probably not the story. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could quote some of the statistics that we've talked about because they're really frightening. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so Dr. Gold is correct in that we are seeing an increase particularly not only in non-melanoma skin cancer, but even more worrisome in melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer. And in rural America and in Nebraska in particular, we've seen a drastic increase, a 17.5% per year increase in, wow. the, in the number of new melanomas diagnosed. And the area 
uh, in which we're seeing it the most is actually in young women uh, under the age of 50 is where we're seeing the, the steepest increases in the diagnose, new diagnoses of melanoma. And what do we attribute that to? That's a great question. I think, like you mentioned, we, we might be catching some of these earlier. So mm -hmm. early diagnosis, we're getting the word out to if you're seeing a new, growing, changing or concerning mole to mm -hmm. see your physician. Uh, but I also think that we know that there is an increase in the number of new melanomas from our increased overall ultraviolet exposure. And there is a relationship, as I recall, you know, back to the early days when I went to med school, between uh, skin cancer and pregnancy. Is that not right? That is true. And there is a, a recent um, large study that was looking at the number of new melanomas diagnosed in pregnancy. And not only is there an increased risk in the development of melanoma during pregnancy, uh, but unfortunately, there's also an increased risk for having a poor outcome or a lower survival overall with pregnancy-associated melanoma. Mm, boy, that's really sad, it's, mm -hmm. but it just means more surveillance, uh, more awareness of the population. Absolutely. You know, we really want to help our viewers out there, and this is one of those things where you can actually take a look at your own skin, notice anything changing. What should we be looking for if we're worried about skin cancer, if we have, say, a spot or a mole that shows up, what should we be watching for? Great question. You know, and as we always say in clinic, uh, really paying attention to your skin and to what might be changing on your skin is extremely important. So anything new, growing, changing, bleeding, particularly not healing, uh, really should be seen by a physician or a board certified dermatologist. Uh, now, when it comes to melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer, uh, we actually have the A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma that can be uh, very helpful when you're looking for changes in your own skin. So A stands for asymmetry, meaning one side of the mole is unlike the other side, and so they're asymmetric or not the same. B is for border. And so if the border of the mole is irregular or poorly defined, that is more concerning. C is for color, meaning there are multiple shades of tan, brown, black, and even sometimes white, red, or a bluish tint. And that can be more concerning than a mole that has just one color. D is for diameter. And really, anything larger than a pencil eraser can be more concerning. And then finally, E is for evolving or evolution. And this is probably the most concerning of all of the different uh, risk factors or signs of melanoma, mm -hmm. because any mole that is really changing or evolving is concerning. So these are the ABCs of melanoma the deadliest form of skin exactly. cancer. That's exactly, that's Unfortunately, right. the rarest, but uh, the, the, the exactly. one we're concerned the most about. Now, when we notice something that may be a little peculiar, when is the best time to see a dermatologist? Is it when we see something? Do we say something then? Or is there a certain age similar to, say, getting a breast exam, where as you get into your 40s, you want to start routinely getting it done? What's the best time to see a dermatologist? Great question, and I think you brought up a very important point. When you see something, say something. So if it does seem abnormal to you, or it's new or different, I think it's absolutely worth bringing up to your physician. Now, as Dr. Gold mentioned earlier in the show, we have a shortage of board-certified dermatologists here in America, and particularly in rural America. And so there are several different things we recommend. Um, one, of course, seeing your primary care physician and talking to them about your overall risk for skin cancer. Uh, in general, if you have a family history of skin cancer uh, or if you have light skin, light hair, light eyes, and atypical moles, uh, we do recommend getting a full head-to-toe skin check with a board-certified dermatologist, typically beginning around age 30. And together with your dermatologist and your primary care provider, you can come up with a skin health prevention plan. Now, for some of our patients that begin developing skin cancer or that have a very strong family history, uh, we will follow those patients annually or sometimes even as frequently as every three months, um, depending on their risk for developing new skin cancers. And so it really is a partnership uh, between all of our different uh, ph physicians and you really knowing your own personal skin health and knowing when it's important to go ahead and ask for help. 
Okay, we have a caller who didn't actually want to come on to live television. It's understandable. We appreciate the call and the question anyway. It's from Andrea in Wyoming, and she's wondering what's better to use a spray-on SPF 50 or 30 plus, whatever it is that you would recommend, or to use the cream. What kind of sunscreen is most effective? I bet you get that question a lot, don't you? <laughs> we get that question a lot. And, you know, I always say the best sunscreen is the one that you're going to use regularly. Now, that being said, um, our sunscreen manufacturers in the United States have really done a fantastic job over the last five to ten years uh, developing a lot of new formulations. And so, so, as you mentioned, those can come in the form of creams, lotions, sprays. Mm -hmm. uh, we even have, you know, sticks that are more like a deodorant stick mm -hmm. and they can tend to be a little bit more waxy. And so it really depends. I think most of our patients really like having a lotion or a cream for the face. Uh, and the sprays can be really great for the body. Now you want to be really cautious mm -hmm. about doing uh, breathing in the spray, of course. Uh, and we even now have powder sunscreens that you can use to kind of reapply, almost mm -hmm. like a facial uh, cosmetic powder that has SPF in it. And a lot of my female patients love that because it's difficult to constantly be reapplying uh, lotion throughout the day. Well, there are a lot of cosmetic products that have sunscreen built Absolutely. into it. Absolutely. A lot of our cosmetic pro products now have a sunscreen that are built in to it, um, but there are several things that you really want to uh, be looking for and making sure of when you're picking out an SPF. And are there specific types of products that are better for children? I mean, is there a limit to the SPF factor for children, or do you still want the maximum protection? And are creams better than sprays for a child, does, or does it not make any difference? Great question. So there uh, really, we don't have we don't have a lot of scientific evidence for looking at the safety of sunscreens in kiddos under about six months of age. Mm -hmm. uh, so we typically recommend that patients and parents really do a lot of sun avoidance or protective clothing when kiddos are really young. Yep. Now, that being said, there are two major types of sunscreen. There are the physical blockers and the chemical blockers. Uh, and so the physical blockers are those that are made up of zinc or titanium sunscreen. Mm -hmm. And we typically recommend those uh, for children, particularly under uh, six months of age. Okay. And as they get older, the blend is okay? Absolutely. And as they get older, and in general, uh, the in the United States, we have both physical and chemical blockers. So physical blockers are the zinc and titanium, and they tend to be more uh, kind of white on the skin, yep. mm -hmm. and they actually reflect the sun's rays, uh, as opposed to the physical blockers, uh, where they are a UV filter, but they actually absorb the sun's rays as opposed to reflecting them. So they're just two different mechanisms by which we can protect the sun, or protect the skin from the sun. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andrea, appreciate that. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Next, we're going to go to Ed from Georgia. Thanks for the call, Ed. Go right ahead. I'm a 76-year-old cowboy, and I worked in the sun 50 years, and I've had three or four basal cell carcinomas surgically removed, and uh, a lot of others froze off with the, the liquid nitrogen stuff. And I want to know, is there supplements I can take or anything that would help my skin to be healthier? That's a really good question. I, I guess uh, what Ed's asking about is, is there something he can do with his diet mm -hmm. to reduce mm -hmm. his risk? Great question, Ed, and you know, thank you so much for calling in. I think your story is a very common story that we hear. And you know, you've had a lot of exposure to ultraviolet rays over the years, and so we can't change that. That's not a risk factor we can change at this point. No, we can possibly reduce it in the future. But we can absolutely reduce it in the future. So, you know, decreasing your sun exposure through um, use of SPF, which we talked about. Uh, also, protective clothing can be really fantastic, and so long sleeves, long pants. Um, now, a lot of the clothing manufacturer, manufacturers actually have UPF, which is an, another type of an ultraviolet protective factor that's built into clothing. Um, but in terms of specific supplements, there actually is some recent data. Uh, there are some oral vitamin B supplements called nicotinamide, 
and we've now shown in prospective studies that taking 500 milligrams twice a day every day of an oral vitamin B called nicotinamide can significantly reduce the number of new non-melanoma skin cancers that you develop. And so that's a fantastic supplement with very low uh, side effects that can that you can be done immediately to reduce your overall risk. Is nicotinamide available in any typical foods that we get or do you have to go to the health food store to get it? We typically or do you recommend need a prescription? you don't need a prescription. <laughs> Great question. You don't need a prescription. You can mm -hmm. really get it at any health food store or over the counter um, pharmacy. Uh, and in general, in terms of eating foods, we know that there is uh, good data for just having an overall healthy diet with nice uh, fruits, vegetables, and antioxidants. Uh, we think that that can help your body really just repair some of the damage that's already been done by the ultraviolet radiation. And so great questions. You know, you're doing a fantastic job if you can really help protect yourself from the sun and protect your skin from the sun. Uh, think about that vitamin B supplement, nicotinamide, and really just regular close exams both by yourself at home as well as by your board certified dermatologist can help you really cut down on those number of new skin cancers. Yeah, we really appreciate that call, Ed, nicotinamide. And I didn't know for sure you were gonna have an answer for that, but that's why we love having the experts on this show because we know you have questions out there in rural America. And that's why we partnered up with UNMC to get you the answers that you're looking for. Give us a call, 877-731-6733. We'll go back to the phones in just a moment, but first let's talk about the cost of getting a full body check done. Is this something that insurance covers as a preventative procedure? And if not, how much are people gonna have to pay out of pocket for something like this, say if they find something abnormal on their skin, they wanna get it checked out. Great question. I, so I think the vast majority of insurance companies will cover a visit to a board certified dermatologist, particularly if you have a concerning lesion. Uh, now skin cancer, uh, I. Skin cancer screenings are also typically approved and covered by your insurance companies. If for some reason it's not approved, out of pocket it would typically cost around $200 to maybe $300 for a full body skin check and a doctor's examination. Um, but overall, the vast majority of dermatologic visits should be covered by your insurance. Okay, excellent. Now let's talk about how the sun is, is in a different position as the seasons change. And some people may actually think, oh, hey, it's a cloudy day today. I don't need to put on my sunscreen. What do we need to keep in mind when it comes to our day-to-day -day work life and sunscreen and protecting ourselves? So that's a really good question because, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that sometimes on the cloudiest of days is when you're at high risk. I mean, I realize that bright water and, uh, and snow, for that matter, mm -hmm. because of the way it reflects the sun's light, can be just as damaging, if not more, than the direct rays. Is that not correct? That is absolutely true, Dr. Gold. And so we really say that any time you're outdoors, you're getting ultraviolet exposure, even on the cloudiest of days. And it can actually be a little bit unassuming because people forget to put their sunscreen or forget to protect their skin, but you're still getting a significant amount of ultraviolet exposure. Uh, the great news is nowadays, we even have apps on our smartphones and you can you know, Google up just about anything to look at the UV index. Mm -hmm. And that tells you the amount of ultraviolet exposure that you're getting when you go outdoors. And so rain, snow, sleet, hail, you're getting ultraviolet exposure. But it varies from hour to hour, too. So it's not like you get up in the morning and say, oh, it's a low UV index this morning. I'm going to be okay all day because by noon uh, it could be a totally different picture. That is a very good point, Dr. Gold. And so, you know, our highest risk times for ultraviolet exposure are really going to be between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. in terms of the peak amount of ultraviolet exposure. So time of day really does matter. And that's a lot of the time that our farmers and ranchers are, are out doing their daily work. That is absolutely correct. Correct. And so we know um, we have great studies that show that particularly our farmers and ranchers and our agricultural workers uh, are at get on average six to eight times as much ultraviolet exposure as indoor workers. And so you, you are correct. They are, our, our farmers and ranchers are getting the very most of ultraviolet exposure. And so are they doing their thing? Uh, that is to say, what's the use of hats, sunglasses, uh, long sleeve garments, you know, really doing the wise things about trying to protect themselves 
or is this something that we need to do a better job to make people aware of, do you think? That's a great question, and I would love to hear from our callers on this. So um, sunscreen is one thing, and we typically recommend sunscreen for the areas that are exposed, but anything that you can cover up with long sleeves, long pants, uh, wide-brimmed hats are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, you know, don't we can't forget to protect our eyes, an extremely important organ with sun, sunglasses. And when you're looking for a high quality sunglass, you're go actually going to want to know that the lenses have UVA and UVB protection, uh, similar to sunscreen. We want to make sure there's mm -hmm. both UVA and UVB protection from the sun. Excellent. Oh, sounds We've got another caller. We've got Frank from Delaware joining the conversation now. Thanks for the call. Frank, are you someone who works outdoors? Yes. All right, go ahead with your question for our panel of experts. Yes, we, I mean, our grandparents used to have the old long sleeve white shirts and the big brim hats when they worked outdoors, and we went away from that as kids went to shorts. And I wonder if that was a big mistake or not. Well, even I think I know the answer to that one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is one of those chances, I think, Frank, where your grandparents were probably right. And, uh, and they were protecting themselves. Uh, you know, it's, we do wear shorts a lot, and people like to enjoy themselves at the pool or at the beach, and uh, in this particularly uh, in the summers or on the golf course. But uh, these types of, of uh, protections are just increasingly important. How much do you... I mean, is there a particular part of the body, Ashley, that we tend to see more sun damage to? That's a great question. So I think uh, in general, the areas that are exposed the most tend to be uh, the head and neck and the face. Now, in terms of melanoma, we know that the highest risk location for men is actually the upper back because, you know, as Frank was mentioning, I think people are wearing a lot less protective clothing, particularly sure. those who are outdoors working and, you know, getting a, a lot of sun exposure. For women, the highest risk location is actually below the knee. It's an area that we often forget about. You know, we might remember to put our sunscreen on our face or on our chest or upper area but we often will forget kind of below the knee. And Frank, you know, I think you are right on. Um, I, our, we, we, our grandparents and parents were absolutely right. And protective clothing can be one of the best ways to really protect our sun, our skin from all of the elements, not just sun. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, you know, studies show that the, the, the equivalent amount of sun protective factor or SPF in just a plain white t-shirt is really only an SPF of four. Huh. But as you mentioned, those plaid shirts. That's like four out of 50. Four out of 50, exactly. Wow. But you know, like plaid shirts, jeans tend to have a much higher, uh, what we would call a UPF or protective factor in clothing. Okay, Frank, thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call and join our conversation. Something that I'm always curious about is the ears. Are we supposed to put that sunscreen on our ears as well? Is that a sensitive spot? Not only are the ears a sensitive spot, uh, but the ears are actually an extremely high risk location. And so particularly for our non-melanoma skin cancers, as Dr. Gold mentioned earlier, they tend to be cured with local surgery alone and aren't as worrisome as melanoma. However, uh, they are considered to be a very high risk location uh, for those tumors going outside of the skin to other parts of the body. And we think because the ears are often an area that are forgotten mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and so you, you not only can we, we we've got to make sure we're putting our sun protective uh, factor on our face, but also on our ears. And I think ears are an area that get often forgotten. You know, Christina, people also uh, develop these malignancies on their lips and on their eyelids frequently. And uh, that's a whole other kettle of fish, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we really do see that there are no areas that the sun can't hit and that uh, skin cancers can't develop. And we do see a lot of high-risk skin cancer on the lips, on the eyelids, on the ears, um, and in areas where really the sun can shine. So that's the lips are protected by the SPF lip balms. Is that right? Correct. And so a lot of the lip balms these days uh, do come with SPF. You know, so look for your chapstick with an SPF of at least 30, uh, and that can absolutely be helpful and, and an area to not forget. Okay. You know, Both we touched... upper and lower, right? <laughs> Don't miss a spot. <laughs> Dr. Gold is right. Now, when it comes to selecting the right SPF, some people may not even know how the scale works. Can you kind of break that down for us, how we actually select the right sunscreen for whatever it is we're doing outdoors? 
That is a very good question. And so when you are trying to select the right type of SPF, uh, what you wanna look for is number one, both UVA and UVB protection, which the FDA now labels on our sunscreens the words broad spectrum. So you wanna look for the words broad spectrum, which means you're gonna get the full ultraviolet protection. The second thing you wanna look for is an SPF of at least 30. Uh, we now have sunscreens that can be labeled as up to SPF of 50. Over 50, there's really no statistically significant difference in the level of sun protection that you're going to be getting. So we really recommend an SPF of at least 30. The third thing you're gonna to wanna to look for is the labeling on the amount of water resistance. And sunscreens can have water resistance for either 40 minutes or 80 minutes. And so that's something that you're gonna want to keep in mind, particularly if you're gonna be outdoors doing water activities or having a lot of sweating. Because uh, it can be very easy to obviously uh, sweat off the sunscreen. So broad spectrum, SPF of at least 30, and you want to know the amount of water resistance in your sunscreen. And are all these products labeled these days? That is correct. So these are the three things that are required by the FDA in all of the labeling for our sunscreens. So you should be able to find all three of those things. All right, this has been such an informative show. We're not even done yet. We're gonna pause for a quick break, but we do wanna hear from you tonight. Our phone lines are open. The number to call is 877-731-6733. We have a lot of ground to cover. When we come back, we're gonna talk about some of the treatment options that are available if you or a loved one is actually diagnosed with skin cancer. Plus, Rob, we know you've been patiently waiting on the phone. We're gonna to get to your call when we come back in just a few moments. You're watching Rural America Live with UNMC. More with Dr. Gold and Dr. Wysong after this. Welcome back to Rural America Live. Tonight, the experts from the University of Nebraska Medical Center are joining us to talk about the dangers of unprotected sun exposure. And we want to hear from you tonight. Give us a call at 877-731-6733 and join the conversation with your questions and comments for Dr. Gold and Dr. Wysong. Let's go right to the phones. Rob from New Mexico, we appreciate your patience. Go right ahead. Yes, um, I have heard that if you live at a higher elevation, that um, you have a greater risk of getting skin cancer. Is that true or false? Thank you, Rob, for calling. And so your question about whether or not you're at higher risk for skin cancer at a higher elevation is true. Uh, for several reasons. One, at higher elevations, uh, there's actually less ozone, so la less natural protection from the sun. Uh, the other reason we see at higher elevations is the sun can actually be a little bit more intense and the ultraviolet index can be higher. Uh, and then finally, at higher elevations, as Dr. Gold mentioned previously, where we get more snow, there's actually quite a bit of reflectance off of the snow, and so uh, people can get more exposure than they might realize. And so we often see um, folks that get quite quite uh, severe sunburns after some ski adventures. Sure. <laughs> great, great question. We appreciate that, Rob. Our next caller calls us from the Sunshine State. We have Dave calling in from Florida. Go right ahead with your question, Dave. Yes, my question is recently on our local news, they were talking about sunscreen and they were saying it can possibly get into your uh, blood system. And my question is, is that true? And if so, could it do damage? Yeah, Dave, you know, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, and I'll start it and then uh, Dr. Wysong can give you the best answer. Uh, there is no question that depending upon how much of a medication that's used topically, whether it's a sunscreen or, or any topical medication, that after enough use of it and a, and a sufficient dose, that almost anything can get absorbed into your uh, bloodstream. And that is true of sunscreens as well, is that not? 
That is true. And as Dr. Gold mentioned, really any type of medication, we're always weighing the risks and the benefits. Uh, when it comes to sunscreen and what you're referring to and what's been on a national news in the last week is uh, the FDA just recently came out with a study just one week ago uh, that showed that for the chemical sunscreens that we were talking about, so not the zinc titanium, mm -hmm. but the chemical sunscreens that uh, in a prospective study looking at 24 individuals when they applied the maximum amount of recommended sunscreen four times a day, uh, we were able to measure uh, levels of the sunscreen in the blood. Now, what the FDA has said is that we still believe all sunscreens to be safe but they are recommending with the chemical sunscreens uh, that some additional studies be taken, uh, be undertaken to further evaluate any potential risk, particularly to young children, to pregnant women uh, through breast milk and other things. And so the, the jury's still out. Further studies are needed. Uh, nonetheless, the uh, American Academy of Dermatology, uh, the American Society of Dermatologic Surgery, uh, really all of our major dermatologic uh, foundations have come out and we are suggesting continued use of sunscreen uh, in, as further studies are being done. And any recommendation, uh, Ashley, regarding frequency of use or, or is it related to SPF factor at all? We just don't know. We just, we just don't know. I think um, the reason the FDA really came out with this information uh, at right now is because uh, previously, we used to use sunscreen uh, in, you know, kind of sparingly throughout the year. Uh, now, as we're realizing what a big deal ultraviolet radiation is for the development of skin cancer, uh, board-certified dermatologists and really physicians everywhere are recommending regular use. And so, therefore, the FDA is saying, particularly these chemical sunscreens, we need to do a little bit more work mm -hmm. to understand if there are any effects. But, you know, as Dr. Gold mentioned, there have been no studies to date, and we've seen dozens and dozens of years now of chemical sunscreen use. Um, without any known systemic or uh, systemic side effects or side effects within the body. Um, but what we're recommending is continuing to use photoprotective clothing, uh, both chemical and physical sunscreens. And if you're concerned at all, I always say the zinc titanium uh, sunscreens or the physical sunblockers uh, can absolutely be used. All right, Dave, thank you so much for that call. And that leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. We'll go back to the phones in just a moment, but we talk about rural America and sometimes how it's difficult to get to a medical facility because they can be 50, 100, even 350 miles away at times. Let's talk about how telemedicine is really able to help in the field of dermatology and how maybe if you find something, you can actually show that to your doctor via telemedicine. Well, that's really a great point, Christina. You know, dermatology is one of those whole areas that lends itself specifically to taking a photo. You know, in some regards, uh, this device is uh, one of the most powerful diagnostic tools uh, that we have, and it can at least uh, inform your physician or whoever is caring for you, your healthcare professional, about whether you need to travel uh, or whether it's something that, you know, we want to see you for in three or six months or maybe something you can just ignore. So I know we're doing a lot of research on teledermatology now and maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gold. And so uh, you're absolutely right, Christina. I think in general, particularly in rural parts of America, we are looking at all types of ways to expand access to care through telemedicine, and in this case, teledermatology. Um, as Dr. Gold mentioned, uh, the skin is an area that lends itself very beautifully to uh, telemedicine or remote uh, diagnosis. Uh, right now at the University of Nebraska, uh, we are developing all of our teledermatology programs with the goal to really be able to uh, increase access and triage dermatology patients from all over the rural areas of America. And so that can mean things like, as Dr. Gold was mentioning, taking a picture with your smartphone and sending it to your physician. Uh, as dermatologists here in Omaha, Nebraska, being accessible to our rural healthcare partners, uh, our other types of physicians and extenders to be able to triage those patients and make recommendations remotely. Uh, and then for those, those really concerning cases, taking a look at the picture and saying, oh no, you need to come see us mm -hmm. right away. And so that's what we're helping, hoping to be able to do uh, through teledermatology services here at the University of Nebraska. And isn't there some software that's being developed that I recently read about that actually can do some preliminary, at least, image analysis based on a photograph and, and determine whether there are warning signs or not? 
That's correct. And we are using uh, all kinds of artificial intelligence and computer deep machine learning to look for patterns within moles um, from pictures taken uh, to give you a better chance uh, uh, to either put uh, lesions into high risk or low risk categories in terms of melanoma. And we're, we're looking at ways to develop uh, ongoing algorithms for different types of dermatologic diagnoses. Okay, uh, now let's just say we have to talk about this because what if you do get a bad diagnosis? How is skin cancer typically treated and how do the options change if that cancer has actually spread to other parts of the body? So as Dr. Gold mentioned earlier, the very good news is, particularly if found early, uh, the vast majority of skin cancers can be very highly cured uh, with all types of local procedures that can be done in your board certified dermatologist's office. Uh, if it's a basal cell carcinoma or a low risk squamous cell carcinoma, typically maintained in that top layer of the skin, uh, we can do things such as freezing, uh, what we call electrodesiccation and curatage, which is kind of a, a scraping and cauterization procedure, um, or we have different types of surgical excision. So a uh, wide local excision is when we surgically remove a skin cancer with a specific amount of normal skin around the actual skin tumor. Uh, and the other type of surgery that we do in dermatology is called Mohs micrographic surgery. Uh, Mohs surgery is a specialized type of surgery that is done in the outpatient setting, uh, typically by a board certified dermatologist with fellowship training in Mohs surgery. And what Mohs surgery does is it allows for removal of skin cancer uh, with complete evaluation of the margins or the tissue edges underneath the microscope. Uh, so a board certified Mohs surgeon or dermatologist with Mohs surgery experience can actually take the piece of tissue, remove it from the skin, take it to the lab to process, and can check 100% of the edges, which means we can look all the way around and all the way underneath to make sure we get all the cancer out. So the cure rates are extremely high, you know, 97 to 100% for basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma while keeping the wound as small as possible. Now, when we get to cancers that go outside of the skin to other parts of the body, uh, Dr. Gold and I know that's when we have to involve our other colleagues and it really becomes a multidisciplinary approach to skin cancer care. So typically chemotherapy, radiation therapy, surgical treatment. You know, as a practicing heart surgeon, I unfortunately saw a number of patients that had melanoma that had spread to the lungs, that had spread to the bones, that had actually, I recall, several patients that had actually spread to the heart, which is one of the more common tumors mm -hmm. that does spread to the heart. And those are tough to treat, right? They absolutely can be tough, tough to treat. Um, the great news is, is that we truly are in a revolutionary era when it comes to treatment of metastatic skin cancer. Uh, we have all kinds of novel chemotherapeutic agents that are targeting specific molecules within both melanoma and high-risk skin cancer like squamous cell carcinoma. The other really amazing thing is the new immunotherapies that we are using at all of the major uh, academic medical centers and, and, uh, and hospitals across the country where we're actually harnessing the body's own immune system to target and fight off those cancer wow. cells. And wow. that's been quite effective. Okay, I'm sorry to wrap you guys. We only have about one minute left. I want to make sure we give Dr. Gold some time for final thoughts and of course to thank you both for being with us tonight. It's really been a great show. Dr. Gold, do you have any final thoughts for us? Uh, just to say that we're always glad for this opportunity and grateful for the RFD TV folks that give us this opportunity. Uh, we want to make sure that rural America is well aware uh, and uh, is looking at their skin and that they know when to call and they know that there's good treatment available for the overwhelming majority of these lesions. Okay, excellent. Really appreciate Dr. Gold and Dr. Wysong for spending some time with us tonight to inform us. And this, like we talked about, could be a life-saving show. So make sure that you let your friends and neighbors know what you learned tonight. You might just be saving their life. Want to thank you so much for joining us right here on Rural America Live. As always, we want to thank you for joining us on Rural America's Most Important Network and continue to follow Rural America Live because we're definitely going to have UNMC back on in the future. There's a a lot going on when it comes to rural health care. We want to make sure that you definitely are kept up with the latest. Also with UNMC. Thank you so much for joining us right here on RFD TV. Hope you have a beautifully blessed night. God bless you. See you next time.